Some of the fire behaviour we're seeing is some things we've never seen before. This wasn't an ordinary fire. This was a climate change disaster and a tornado. And they couldn't stop it. They just get out of control. I was seriously worried for my life. It doesn't get any bigger wake-up call than this. What's happening here in Australia is really a warning to all of us. Australia will never be the same after this. We've been going this non-stop for five and a half months. We have not had a break. We started early on the northern part of the state, but it never stopped. A summer of fire and ash haunts Australia. We ended up really with all the areas of the state alight all at once. We've burnt a record amount. The scope of damage from hundreds of massive brush fires is staggering. 30 lives, 27 million acres, a billion animals, hundreds of firefighters hurt close to 3,000 homes incinerated. I think we have over 1,000 lost on one day, and that's on New Year's Eve. 57% of people here have been directly affected by the fires or the smoke. Recent heavy rains have helped immensely, but dozens still burn. Because we're in a drought and the landscape's so dry, these fires are taking hold and proving really difficult to put out. Bushfires are a part of the fabric of life here. For about six months around the summertime, we see a mix of severe weather. We get extreme heat waves, we get bushfires, we get tropical cyclones every single year. But not like this. We're seeing these events that we've never seen before, so it's therefore really hard to control them because we don't really know how. Unprecedented is the word people keep using. It's this um, unprecedented. It's completely unprecedented, completely out of the blue. I've been uh, photographing fires for about 25 years. Places you would normally consider safety zones and areas you could get out of, or areas where the fire behaviour shouldn't be that bad, fires were tearing through there. It was very hot and it was very dry for a really long period of time before the fires started. Officially it was the warmest and driest year on record and those records go back to the early 1900s and that's the country as a whole. We had such little rain and such high temperatures that that exacerbated that bushfire fuel and that's why we saw such bad bushfires at the end of the year. Heat and drought conditions in southeast Australia are often the product of natural weather patterns. We saw two strong climate drivers affecting Australia. One of them was a positive Indian Ocean dipole, which is basically a pattern of sea surface temperatures in the Indian Ocean that causes above average temperature and below average rain in Australia. This positive dipole was the strongest in 20 years. We also had a negative southern annular mode at the end of the year. Basically that caused windier than usual conditions and drier than usual conditions in New South Wales. But then also we've actually warmed by one degree Celsius. So it was all those things coming together in I guess the perfect storm of events that really made this summer so extreme. But these temperatures and winds and drought were amplified by a third distressing factor. Hello, we have serious climate change going on here. Scientists have been ringing the alarm on climate change for decades. One of the loudest modern day voices is Dr. Michael Mann, an American climatologist, professor and author. Mann just happened to be in Sydney on sabbatical during the record-breaking wildfire season. It's pretty easy to connect the dots on this one. Uh, again, we would not have been seeing uh, such widespread, intense and fast spreading fires if it were not for the dryness and the heat due to human caused climate change. Why should someone watching this and the United States and South Florida care about what's happening thousands of miles away in Australia? Well, what's happening here in Australia is really a warning to all of us. Pretty soon, we are going to see the same sorts of unprecedented events. Climate change is clearly one of the key things that drives fire and fire behaviour. How do we know these things? 
because we can read English. It's been documented time after time after time and now the science has developed to the stage where we can actually start to pin individual fire events to actual changes, changes in climate. Here the triggers of fire's fury descend from the sky. The fires we've had are overwhelmingly lightning strike fires that have caused a lot of destruction this year. And when we have dry lightning strikes, then we have more ignition points and we have more issues to do with fire. They weren't able to stop the ignitions. They were just, lightning strike would uh, start something up and they just couldn't stop it. Often it's a vicious and merciless cycle. As lightning sparks fire, fires can in turn create lightning. Fires get so big, they start creating their own lightning and their own wind. The huge plumes of smoke cool as they rise into the atmosphere. Then they form clouds that can cause thunderstorms. New fires spark, winds whip, often overwhelming anything in its path. Firefighters sometimes lucky to escape. As fires give rise to more fire, climate change amplifies even more climate change. It's called the carbon feedback loop. That carbon that we've been putting out of the atmosphere is now being released back into the atmosphere in terms of smoke, but it continues because the dead trees that come down, they will rot over the next 10 years and they're still releasing carbon. They have now, in a period of uh, a couple months, put as much carbon into the atmosphere uh, because of these bushfires than they had put into the atmosphere from the last year. Vibrant forests reduced to poles of soot. Many of the trees here are resilient to fire, but not these climate amplified infernos. These fires being unusually hot and large scale may mean the usual ways of forest regenerating don't exist, which then means that we don't get that big flush of regrowth, which would start to suck the carbon back in. Some areas have been burnt three or four times in 25 years. So the frequency of fire and the interval between fire has changed. And if we don't manage that, we will lose those ecosystems because they simply can't have long enough to, re to recover before they get smashed again. We're seeing fires in places that really shouldn't burn, such as the subtropical rainforest. The fire frequency is increasing, the size of the fires is increasing, they're becoming earlier. Our fire season now can be like eight months long. It's not, a, it's not just three months of summer. And if that certainly is the new norm for us, then we have to have a good think about what that looks like for us going forward. So the fires that we have just experienced now occurred under one degree of global warming. So what can we expect in 20 or 30 years time? What will these fires be like then? Climate change is a global disease. Wildfires are just one symptom. Florida is no stranger to fire, but large scale blazes are mitigated by controlled burns and built in humidity. Here, the threat of climate change is not a song of fire but of water. We're the tip of the spear. One of the biggest impacts of climate change is sea level rise. And most people here in South Florida live at about sea level and near the sea. If you're in Southern Florida, if you've experienced flooding uh, from these king tides, they inundate the streets of Miami Beach and, and Fort Lauderdale. Add on these intense hurricanes and the storm surge from, from those events. Pretty soon you're talking about large parts of the coast of Florida becoming uninsurable. Sea levels are projected to rise between 8 and 14 inches over the next 10 years, between a foot and two feet in 20 years, and as much as three feet by 2060. We may see sea level rise in this century that could put 4 to 13 million Americans underwater permanently. It may not be possible in all places to keep that water out. And it's those numbers that are forcing many shoreline communities to do the unthinkable, retreat. Five years ago, when I started thinking about retreat, it was considered a far off future option that has rapidly changed as different local governments, different states are thinking about how to manage flood risk into the future. Regardless of where you are now, whether it's Florida, whether it's here in Australia, the impacts of climate change are no longer subtle. We're seeing them play out in real time now, and we're already seeing the threat that they pose to us and our environment. Whether it's fire or water, climate change is Earth's most formidable threat. The lessons of Australia echoing across the globe for those willing to listen. I think this is an example of what some parts of the world can expect in the future. Are we dealing with a new normal? No, it actually is worse than that. It's an ever worsening sliding baseline of climate change impacts if we fail to act. Considering that we've only just warmed by one degree and we're really starting to see these huge impacts now, 
what's going to happen on a three degree world. And that's sort of a cautionary tale for the rest of us. Uh, if we continue to warm the planet, larger and larger regions of the United States and Europe and everywhere else will become uninhabitable to, to human beings essentially. My plea to the rest of the world is don't go down this path. If we just ignore it, it'll go away and we will go away with it.